so um, hello again. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you uh, for participating in this webinar offered by the European um, School Education Platform, the European Commission's Platform for School Education in Europe. My name is Maria Elena and I will be coordinating uh, today's webinar. Um, as I mentioned, let me remind you of some technicalities. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, this uh, session is being recorded and you will be able to find uh, the recording on uh, the ESEP's YouTube channel uh, from next week onwards. Um, also, we would like to encourage you and invite you to share any thoughts, uh, questions or cons concerns uh, through the chat. And uh, any question relevant to today's um, topic uh, will be answered by our speaker, Brazil, towards the end uh, of this webinar. Um, one more thing I would like to remind you is that towards uh, the end of this session, me or my colleague Marta will share with you uh, an evaluation form because your feedback is very important and it, it helps us uh, to become better and better. So with no further delays, I would like to say a few words about our speaker. So for today's webinar, we have uh, invited uh, Persil Swartz. Uh, Persil holds a master in uh, communication and psychology and has a lifelong experience engaging teachers and pedagogues in exploring and improving their teaching practices by encouraging um, them, the teachers, to show curiosity to children's uh, daily life experiences in their educational environment and also encourages teachers to include children's perspectives as a basis for improvement, as he has collaborated with uh, multiple uh, research centers and universities, uh, where she has provided her expertise on the above topic. So today, uh, Brazil will help us explore the importance of uh, respecting children's voices, uh, along with some ethical considerations that teachers face uh, mm -hmm when it comes to including uh, students' experience and voices in teaching. So, um, I don't want to waste any more time. So, Brazil, uh, the floor is yours. I will uh, serve the presentation right away. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Maelena. So, I would start thanking for getting this opportunity to, uh, to share some of the thoughts and considerations and the knowledge that I've uh, built over the last 30 years uh, working with including children's perspective in education. Um, my starting point, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm most familiar with early childhood education and care, but I will include examples from graduate school as well, uh, like working in connection to that as well. But it means that I have, mm, you know, I, I've been changing between using the terminology of or a pedagogue or early childhood teacher, and I just decided to call them adults all the way through this uh, presentation. Um, and also, um, there's a lot of competences among all you people participating, and some of you will have heard things before, some of it will be something that you've forgotten and recall, and some of it might be new. I hope by the end of this session that you will feel at least inspired by some new thoughts. That's my aim for the thing. Yeah. So, Mylena, could you, could you? Yeah. So, what we're going to get through during the next, like, almost an hour is I'll tell you a little bit about including children's perspective in education. Why should we do that and how? Um, then there's going to be some short time for you to reflect on what some questions I, I raise for you and then I'm going to dig into these ethical considerations. When do we need to have these considerations and how are we going to do it? Because this is a very complex area. And then we will finally end up share some of our reflections using the Learn Lab Net. So if you have the time now, you can actually log into that already. So you have it ready once we get that far and we'll end up having a bit of a dialogue, as Marilena said. Mm -hmm. We all in we represent so many different countries and we represent early childhood education and graduate schools. So we have so many different curriculars. So it would be very difficult to to kind of dig into something in particular, like all of us are dealing with language uh, development and motor skills, uh, analytical um, skills, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all different to every country. But what we share is that we all 
have to buy into and wish to buy into, I hope, uh, the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. And I'm sure that most of you are already familiar with Article 12, that state parties shall assume shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own views the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. That's the one thing. And the Article 13 is also interesting in this um, connection because it says that the child should have the right to uh, freedom of expression. And this right shall be, include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print, in the form of art, or through any other media of the child's choice. And this exercise is this exercise of the right may be certain restrictions, but these should only be such as provided by law and are necessary for the respect of the right of and reputation of others or for the protection of national security or of public order or of public health and morals. So there are a few limitations, but basically children have uh, the right to express themselves. So far, so good. And that's a thing that we at an EU level buy into and, and wish to deal with. So that's uh, common for all of us. Please move on, Melina. Because one thing is the convention uh, in itself, but it's also connected to education. Uh, in the European Union, it's connected to um, the plan for children's rights, where uh, the area number two is, is specific addressing education. And it's also part of the UN Sustainable Goals, where, for instance, you could mention the four, uh, number four of quality in education, but that's also connected to some of the other goals, which is like uh, number 10, reducing inequalities, or number, fe number five, uh, reducing uh, or creating gender equality. So uh, it's something that it's important, like by legislation and by the political um, uh, documents that uh, all of us have to address. But it's also something that we, especially in early childhood education and care, had a long tradition of doing this thing about actually uh, listening to what's at stake for the children. And I just want to mention one thing, for instance, like the care project that took, care, um, that took place back in 2014 to 2016, where 11 uh, EU countries collaborated around uh, finding uh, What's the, what's the common quality of early childhood education and care in Europe and how do children benefit from it? And they were looking into creating cultural sensitive quality indicators. And in this, one of them, uh, one of the things that they address is, is that each child enjoys being in the center and has positive affectionate relationship with the educators and other children. The child feels respected and valued with regard to his or her own abilities, ideas, and backgrounds. And then the thing that I've um, highlighted is the child feels hurt by the educators and his or her ideas are taken into consideration. That's one of the quality criteria that the came, CARE project came up with. Please move on, Maggie. So this addresses that uh, when we look into the UN Convention and this way of thinking about children, there's an underlying understanding of children when this, for instance, the text saying the child who is capable of forming his or her own views, because it means that, you know, sometimes we perhaps have a, a view of the child that they might not be capable. And we have the other sentence saying the views of the child being given due weight in, in, with the age and maturity of the child. So it's a decision of the adult to whether to include the child's perspective or not. So it's kind of a balance that we, we have to. And also, I would like to challenge that view of the child a little bit. So please take next, my, uh, my leader, just one. Yeah, because underlying this thinking is the view of a child that we have this idea that over the years in an educational setting, you increase your maturity as a child. But, and please the next, Melina. What happens, and one more is that in fact, 
children, you know, sometimes you mature and then sometimes you, you step backwards and, and things change all the time. So at a general level, all of us, most children, or that's what you at least as an educator will be looking into, is this child growing in maturity? Is it reaching the, the, uh, the things that we wish for them to attain in their educational life? And this puts a lot of stress on a lot of important to the adult role. So please, Mylena. Uh, because um, the adult we know has so much power in defining what's at stake, not only in the room, but also what's at stake for the child in relation to understanding the child itself. Um, so this illustration is to kind of show that it's the, the adult have so much power for the child to define who am I in the world? What kind of person am I? And with this comes a lot of responsibility. Please move on. And over the years, you know, we mature and we expect uh, these children to get more mature and be more at an equal level uh, with us as adults. And in addressing that power responsibility, we uh, as teachers, educators, adults have to uh, be ethically very aware of what is it that we um, frame, give, give the children of, as opportunity to, to understand themselves in the world. So that's one reason why we need to be really carefully listening to what, what's, what's happening to them. It's, it's huge responsibility. Yeah. Please move on. Uh, and Danish philosopher, Søren Kierkegaard, he addressed this back in 1859. And he said, well, if you consider the adult as a helper, if you want to truly succeed in leading a person to a specific place, one must first and foremost take care of finding him where he is and begin there. So you need to figure out what's at stake for the child in order to lead it somewhere. And education is about helping children, leading them in some direction that is important for them in life. This is in the entire art of helping. Anyone who cannot do this is who cannot do this is himself under a delusion. If he thinks he's able to help someone else, in order to help someone else, I must understand more than he, but certainly first and foremost understand what he understands. So we need to understand the perspective of the children if we want to move them to another, help them move to another place. If I do not do that, then my greater understanding does not help him at all. And this is important. If we don't understand what's at stake, we don't we miss a point and we don't help the child growing. We might help them um, actually not wanting to be at school or not wanting to, to be part of the community. If I never less want to assert my great understanding, then it is because I'm vain or proud. Then basically, instead of benefiting him, I really want to be admired by him. But all true helping begins with a humbling. The helper must first humble himself under the person he wants to help and thereby understand that he helps is not, uh, is not to dominate, but to serve. That to help is not to be the most dominating, but the most patient. That to help is a willingness for the time being to put up with being in the wrong and not understanding what the other understands. So again, this holding back our own pre uh, conception of what is going on and be curious to what is going on in the mind and the experiences, the senses of the children we are among. Please move on, Alina. So this power balance and responsibility that um, has something to do about, uh, that's connected to how we think about the learning environment for, for the children as well. So having this great uh, responsibility, just move on. We will often think about, um, yeah, that the adult is kind of mm, putting up the frame of the learning environment. It's the adult who kind of plan things, figure out whatever things should look like. And sometimes, um, please move on, Melina. 
sometimes we forget that in this uh, room, that in this learning environment, we have so many children and these balloons, they symbolize the children. All these children that are also doing things that all have the different minds and the different views of what is going on. A, a colleague of mine, when we were teaching uh, kindergarten teachers, um, used this metaphor with the balloons in order to, to kind of convey that if you see the child as, a, as, as a balloons, you can never get access to what's inside their heads or their minds. You have to invite them to, to show it to you. And therefore, we need to be curious in order to understand all the things that they do, how they affect and negotiate the learning environments as it is happening. Just move on, Malia. Because in relation to that, the learning environment is so much bigger. It's also all these things that happen between the children and things that we don't know anything about. And it's also actually, that's why I made like this, this, this stri the, um, the stipple line, which is like, it's also connected to what's outside and the parents and the free time things and all these things. So the learning environment is a very complex size. And I guess that is why we at an OECD level says that, that being a teacher and dealing with learning uh, an adult with, with dealing with education is more complicated than building um, a rocket flying to the moon. Um, because there's so many things going on. So what you need to pay attention to as the adult is the whole thing going on between the children and how they form, how they grab the learning environment. And still remember that you as the adult have so much power in forming them and forming the community that they have between them. Mylena? Yeah. So, understanding of children's perspective, and please move on, <laughs> because there would be uh, three different ways that we would typically understand uh, this thing, this, the terminology of children's perspectives. Please move on. One thing is that we have this adult view when the adult have a, a view of the child and try to understand what is at stake for the child. Okay, I look at the child, it's based on my academic knowledge and skills and my personal experiences about being a, a child in a learning environment, et cetera, et cetera. So you get your, uh, your professional ideas about what is at stake for this child. And the next one, which is where you really intend to try to understand what is at stake for the child. So it's in, based on uh, it's based on the all the empathy that you can show and all the things that you can gather when you are being aware of your and critical to your own preconceptions. So it's it's a, a way of trying to feel what the child is feeling, trying to understand what the child is, is understanding. So trying to experience the world from their view, knowing that you can never do that. It's inside the balloon but you do your best to try. And that's something that we as uh, neurons recognize uh, between us as people. And the next one. And then there's finally the, the, the obvious one with ch children perspective being what they express themselves about what they see and understand. Expressions that can be based, and that's very important, not only on the verbal uh, expressions, but also the non-verbal articulation and experiences uh, that the child shows. So we know that you, you can say that I'm walking away, I had enough, but you can also just walk away or you can enlighten up and be really engaged and you don't need to say, I love this. So there's things you do, you express with your body as well. So these are the three different areas where uh, or ways of understanding children's perspectives. Please move on. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Uh, of course, when the child says something, you would always be curious to what is it that the child said? So when the child said, uh, I really love this. Being in this room, for instance, or I love playing with this thing, you would say, you love it. Could you tell me a little bit more about 
what's fascinating or what do you love about it? And you will keep asking the child. And often there's a, an advice saying that you would keep asking at least three times. So you keep exploring and digging into what the child means by what it's, what, what, how it is expressing itself. Uh, and as an example, that the one was a child who said in, in a kindergarten saying, oh, I really miss my parents. And the adult kind of took the child up and, and told the parents, you know, your child miss you a lot when it's in kindergarten and you really need to do that. When the parents came around, they figured out that, well, the child said, I really miss my parents. It said that to the parents as well. I really miss, I really miss my mom and dad. And the mom and dad went like, what is this about? And they figured out that it was when the child felt that something was strugglesome, something that was difficult in the kindergarten, the child who was three years old would say, I miss my mom and dad, because then it got the attention of the adults. So, so sometimes the things that children say uh, mean something different from what we think it does. So you need to, to dig into this um, exploration of what is behind the expression of the child. So now in a minute, I'm going to ask you to reflect a bit. So, but first I want to show you, this is a photo that was taken years ago <laughs> of me when I was in a place where they have a house where all the furniture is like built like, so when you get in as an adult, you would feel like a child. And when I got up there and sat at that chair, I suddenly remember what it was like to be stuck on a chair, not being able to get down or get out and be like that. And I could use that experience for, let's say that, um, I wonder what it's like being in a classroom or at a table in a kindergarten, and you are actually touched by the physical environment. It does something to your way of thinking, to your way of moving, that is very diff different to what I, as an adult, experience. But what it could also tell me is that um, even here, you could feel like some empathic, okay, what would it be like to sit here? If it was a child, what is the child experience? And also you could say, um, did the child, would a child that sat there at a table, does it express something? So for instance, um, this teacher told me about there was a child in the classroom who wanted to wear like a, a hat, I don't know what you call it, when it's, it's something that covers the ears. Uh, and the teacher said, we don't wear hats in, in the classrooms. And actually, because I had been sitting on that chair, I thought there's something here that we need to look into. So I asked the teacher, why, uh, how does it affect the child that it wears a hat? And the teacher said, oh, it, it's actually concentrating better. And then we figure out, inspired by this physical idea of sitting on a, on a chair and um, this empathic thing about looking into what does the child experience when it sit there? Why is, what does it wear the hat? What, how is the hat helping the child? We got to this idea that, ah, okay, the child is actually protecting itself from the noise in the classroom. It helps it concentrating. And then the teacher ended up saying, well, the child can actually wear the hat in the room. That's fine. Because then the teacher used it as an indicator of now things were getting a little bit too noisy and, and helping the children to connect. So the child actually worked out for itself how to concentrate in the room. So if you move on, Eilina, I would ask you to just spend one minute to think about how do you feel when someone apply their view at you? As like in, in a teacher that um, the, the first kind of experience where somebody thinks something about you. Just, just give it like 20 minutes or 20 seconds thought. How does it feel when someone has their idea about you? Yeah, and if you, if you if you want to share it, you could share in the chat.
but you're also welcome to just think about it. Um, many of us as adults would have tried it with, we have like a manager or a boss or someone else who has an idea about how, how we are doing. Um, yeah, but move on to the next one, Mayelena, please. Then the feeling about is someone intend to understand you, they do the best to understand you know, to be empathic to your experience. How does that feel like? Though so they might not succeed, but they, they try to understand what's at stake for you. And then the last one. And what when people actually recognize and listen to what you do express about how you feel and how you are and what's at stake for you. Because these things, they all the three ways they, they feel different for us, but, but they're at stake all the time. They're, they're active all the time in order for us as human beings to understand each other. Uh, so we always need to, to kind of address these things. And, and we always need to think, just move on to the next slide, please. That this is so complex and so complicated because the learning environment, it's, it's a negotiated process that works all the time, it develops all the time. It's not a one time, this is what things is about. It's, it keeps changing. So we, we have to capture things in the flux. So we will never find a final truth, but our glimpse into the complexity that is mirrored in a unique moment of understanding may lead to an important positive change when we manage to change our thinking and actions to become even more aligned with the need of the child and the child community. So we all do our best to understand and help children, but there's often things that we can do even better. And I want to use an example from, from a, a second grade where, where I was in and this, um, I figured out there was a child in the class who said it was terrified and it, it had trouble concentrating. And, and you could see that when in the classroom that the child just didn't feel comfortable. And, I uh, had the opportunity to to talk to the child and say how how are you doing and and what's happening in the in, I mean, how how are you in the classroom and the child said well I really don't like the system I'm afraid of the the three cross system which was a system that this new and very engaged teacher has has put into the class where every time the children misbehave they would get like a cross and when you had three crosses you would have a note going to your parents that they really need to help you to behave at school. And this child had problems concentrating because the child was so afraid of doing something wrong and actually told me about on one occasion, uh, they were out playing in, in the schoolyard and some of the, this was a group of, of, of girls and some of the boys, they took a shoe from one of the girls and this child reflected upon, should I actually help the girl getting her shoes back or should I run to the classroom classroom because the bell has rung? Uh, and the child chose to, to help the other girl getting her shoes back. And well, actually some ran for the shoes and others carried the girl into the classroom. So they made it ring. Uh, but that was just an example of how much energy this child used on behaving. And I talked to the teacher about that. And the teacher said, oh, this is because I put this system into the class in order to get um, less noise in the, in the classroom. But it seems like it doesn't work on the children that I really hoped it would work at. And it also seems now that it's actually doing something bad to the some of the children that, that even feel worse at class. So I need to find a new system. And the teacher, he included the children in, in finding a new system saying, we really need to have it more quiet in, in the classroom for, more, for all of us to be able to concentrate. And the children came up with this idea. And you can move on, Marilena. That the teacher could pick up a paper napkin and then let it drop from the desk. And when the teacher did that, they had to be quiet. And he would never have gotten that idea himself, but it worked. It worked because once, of course, the people at the back, the children at the back, they couldn't see the, the paper napkin when it dropped, but it, the 
children in the front, they could see it and they helped each other being quiet. So this was the thing that worked for a while. And it's just a way of collaborating by understanding what's at stake for the children. Please move on. So we have many opportunities as adults to learn from the children. We can do that as a systematic exploration, like all of us, there are many different ways of working with evaluation, but we always all know this thing with the data collection and analysis and then an improvement. So that's like a bigger kind of research, but there's also the small tensions in everyday life that happens. Please move on. And one example is uh, at an after school uh, activity center. They had the situation with um, the children. They wanted to make, uh, ah, what do you call that? They want to play with each other after school. So they went to the activity center and then they want to join each other after school. So they want to go home with a friend. And the staff, they used a lot of time to call parents and say, oh, could Sophie go and join Brian or whatever? Um, and that took time away for the adult to be with the kids. And also the children got very frustrated often because the people at the activity center, they couldn't get hold of the parents and then they couldn't make these play agreement. So they came up with making these cards where you can take the next two, Marilena, where they had a, a green, yellow and a red card that they asked the children to draw, which was like whether they had like today I can go and play with a friend or today I might be able to go and, and play with my friends. Um, you had to call my parents or today I cannot play with my friends. And as you see at the red one, that's something that you really don't want to happen as a child because obviously this child is, is very sad when that is the situation, but it happens. The interesting thing was that the children said there's something missing. So they added in another one, uh, which was, I already have an agreement today. So my parents made an agreement yesterday that today I can go and play with Sophie, for instance. And that situation, using the blue card all of a sudden, made it possible for the staff and the, to tell the parents that, you know what, it makes a lot of difference to your children if you make these agreements on beforehand. It gives them more comfort at, at the early childhood setting. Um, and also, uh, you would, um, they could use it as once the parents, they started using these cards, they could see, look into, well, who, which, whom of the children have a lot of relations, whom do we need to support to, to strengthen their relation in the child community. So it, it ended up being a, a beta in, in a system. Yeah, please move on. Time is running. So when we have this systematic exploration, there needs to be some initial um, preparation. So we need to look into what needs to be explored because we might have an idea as an adult, but we don't know if the children agree. Do they have an idea of something that's that's actually even more important exploring than the adult thing? Next one. So ethics in choosing the subject of exploration is very important to consider. Who is the subject most relevant to? Might there be other subjects that children would find more important? And what would be the most respectful way to address the subject, et cetera, et cetera. So could the children be included in actually uh, deciding what needs to be explored? What does we as adults need to learn more about? And this I just added in a slide. You can see the slide just uh, afterwards. It's just an example of a guiding structure with a lot of questions that they use in the education uh, department in Victoria and Australia, where they run through all these different stages and have questions that you can use for um, being curious to through the way that you form your um, investigation. And the point is that these questions, they are uh, one fact, <laughs> they are they're never ending. You know, this this is some that were chosen in Australia. We need to keep addressing these. And we always have the doubt, is there something else that I could consider? And it, it's a never ending thing. There's endless uh, questions that we can raise. Yep. So 
One thing is that how is the data collected? And now, Marlena, there's going to be a lot of <laughs> things coming up. So just keep pushing. Uh, yeah. And when we figure out how is the data collected, we need to have who get access to inform us. Is it only some children or is it all of the children? And does a child wish to inform us or is it something that we wish them to do? When we think about the analysis, we have to think about what can we learn from the experience of the child? But when we think about what we learn, do the child agree in our analysis? Or is it something that we didn't see? What will we change in order to improve the learning environment? And again, does the child have other better suggestions for improvement? For instance, the napkin? And how will the children know that the contribution made a difference? So they helped us figure out a lot of things, but can they actually see a change? And do the child agree that this is the ending of the exploration or do they think that we actually need to improve even more? So it's just an overall major perspective on things that we need to address in, in ethical matters. So some of the many social psycholo psychological aspects on getting ASICs to enlighten us, whom is part of it. So we need to, how do we ensure to address our pre-understandings? That's one thing we have to think about. Does age, maturity, gender, ethnic, ethnicity, social class, does that influence if they get access to our attention and to our understanding? And we also need to consider how can systems, colleagues, etc., support us in in understanding our preconceptions, because as a natural thing, we, we don't we can't understand them themselves. So we need something else to mirror us. Next one. What is at stake for the child? Well, how much how much child participation affect its position and social stages in the community of children? If you include two children, how does that affect their relation to their friends and peers and the whole dynamic between all the children? How, when, and with whom may the child benefit the most from participating? Also important questions. And what is the quality of our relation? Does the child experience trust in our relation or would it actually find it uncomfortable to, to enlighten us? Uh, then we might not be enlightened at all. And getting consent, there are some considerations as well. Does the parent give consent? Well, they have to because it's children, so the parents have to give consent. But does the child give consent? And how does it know what it agrees to? Uh, what if, if the parents and the child disagree on the child's participation? And some of the things that, you know, even the youngest children, how, how, how do they know what they agree to? These things about could you could you have, uh, for instance, older children telling them what is going to happen to the process or you can make drawings, picture book, whatever to, to give them an idea about what is what is it about? Next one, please. Another thing is that being aware that giving consent is not a one time thing. So you need to address that the child can withdraw and make sure that it knows that it can withdraw. Some may use like cards that the child can, can put on the table saying, I'm, I'm out, <laughs> I don't want to participate anymore, or in other way, make it easy for the child to say, I'm out. Uh, and how can the child, again, re-engage if it, it went out and then it changed its mind and said, oh, I still want to be in this. And does the child know that it can actually re-engage? So it, consent is an ongoing thing. And again, expectation. What expectation does a child hold in relation to the outcome? Uh, how do we invite feedback on the, child, on the child's experience of participating? So do we actually get feedback from them? Do you think I learned the thing that I could learn from you? Are there more things I need to learn? Um, how do we know that they think, okay, we, we made the right things, we made the changes, we saw the things that we needed to see, et cetera. So getting access to inform us, there's some of many methodological concerns um, that we need to look into. Choice of methods. So how do different methods and potential combination of methods support our insights? So 
using a camera is different from using uh, drawing methods, using photographs, using interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And do the methods that we ch that methods that are chosen, do they give the child appropriate time and opportunity to reflect and express themselves? Because many children, as adults actually, we need when we uh, uh, have to answer something or, or, or express a view, we need our time to to think about how we do that. And what say does a child have in the choice of methods? Uh, can they? Contribute? Can they have an idea about how we can get wiser on their perspective? And the next one, please. And the social psychological aspect: Do the method meets the child preferred way of expressing itself? Is there actually something that we ask them to do? We ask them to draw, and they don't like drawing, or we like them to to say something, but they're really shy and don't want to say things. Will the child be more comfortable alone or in a group of children? Would the child be more comfortable being anonymous? That would be many different things. This picture on the left-hand side, you would never guess it. That's a photo that a child had taken from an important part of their learning environment. And you can get the idea that, well, it's outdoor. But the child had actually taken a photo of a cat, but the cat just went away. It disappeared. But it's still, in, in the mind of the child, it's still a photograph of a cat because the cat was an important part of, of the playground. There was this striped cat coming by. So the interesting thing is you, you cannot just use one method and thought, think you find the truth. You need to add different methods and, and see how you can get in these conversations and dialogues with the children in order to understand what's at stake. And you can never find a, a, a final truth. And attention that you need to hold during the process and the data collection and the follow-up is you, you need to pay attention to witnessing and understanding. So take your time to pay thorough attention. Be sure that you understand, repeat what you inter interpretation of the, of the children are and um, see how they react to it. Do they feel that you got it? Ensure that the exploration is open-ended. Never get to a final truth because things are complicated and on the way. Be aware of addressing subjects in a way that the child feels comfortable. And by this, it's like you would never go and ask a child, well, how does it feel being bullied? You, you, it would be very unethical. There's something that you as an adult really need to know, but you would start by asking something that the child would actually feel good about engaging and spending their breath and their life engaging in. So could you show me the places where you really like to play in the kindergarten or the place where you feel comfortable in, in the classroom? And perhaps the child choose to ex tell some other things to you as well, but it has to be something that comes from the children. Also be aware that the child owns the data Get allowance if you wish to share data produced by the child and make sure that if it's a collaborative work at school, that children don't share each other's data, that you need to make sure that they have the ownership. And be aware of the possibility uh, of the possible need to make photos, videos and sound recording anonymous when you convey things afterwards and et cetera, et cetera. There are an endless amount of things that you could be aware of. So this is just some of them. But the thing you see at the right side that's inspired by your code, where you could put up uh, um, notes about what do you really love in this place? Uh, so it became like a wish tree. What do you wish for this tree, uh, for this place to, to turn into in a few years? And you would have all these vicious and, and input from the children, for instance. Yeah. Potential dilemmas, some of the many dilemmas in this is like the child participation as disturbance versus engagement. So the child particip participation, um, do they come up with idea and you as an adult, because you're in charge and have the power, do you feel like they disturb you? Or are they actually engaging in informing you things that are important to them? 
individual versus group, do you address one individual or do you have to address the whole community? Exploring versus taking action in relation to the subject. So, so this, do, when do you keep exploring and when do you start changing your the things that you that have enlightened you? It's never you can explore forever. So, what is the time to to say this is it? We're gonna do something new. The adult responsibility for interference versus the potential insight. So when you see something that you think, ah, this is something that I'm, I feel like, um, and I, by my academical and human knowledge, know that this might feel terrible for the child. Should I continue exploring what's at stake, what happens between the children or whatever it is, or should I stop it? From happening, so that's that's always a dilemma. And of course, you never want children feeling hurt, but it, it's hard to say when to when to stop the exploration. And that's keeping secret versus caretaking. So, what do you do when a child um, tell you that this is my secret place and I hide some of the toys in this place because I want to keep them for myself? Or that could be one thing that is a very um, an important secret for the child and and would you how would you take care of the growing up and how to deal with sharing things or hiding things or getting access to the things you want to play with etc that's a very innocent example it could be something that are even worse that you would um where you would have the balance that you have to take care of the child versus keeping the secret of the child. So how do you, by the beginning of the research, tell the child that if I become aware of things that are I as an adult and with my background thing that is harming you, I have to uh, react to it in order to protect you. I don't know as much of this as they could. It could be hard for children to understand what it is when you're five years old. I mean, if you use an example of it might be a little bit silly, but if you take like Harry Potter that most of us know, uh, Harry Potter didn't find it troublesome to live in, in this tiny little room under the staircase uh, because it didn't have anything to compare with. But if you came across a child that told about, well, I live uh, among the brooms underneath the staircase, you might wish to, to react to it. And again, the one the last, next one I thought was keep keeping or conveying knowledge about colleagues. What about when you get to know about your colleagues? And for instance, this teacher with the napkin got to know about another colleague because they asked the children. Uh, he asked the children, "Well, if any of us adults should have free crosses, would would there be any adults who should have free crosses?" And the child and the children said, "Well, you should have one for." whatever it was the, the, the teacher did. But they also mentioned a fellow teacher that should also have crosses for, for yelling at the, chief, at the children. So how do you deal with that? Time is running. So next one, <laughs> Elena, please. Yeah. So again, notice um, the right to protection that the children hold uh, in, in according to Article 16 in, in, in the Convention of the Rights of the Child. No child should be subjected to arbitrary and all lawful interference with his or her privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to unlawful attacks on his or her honor and reputation. The child has the right to protection of the law against such interference or attacks. So finally, ethical guidelines, because we can't have all these questions, but we can put up some guidelines that can enlighten us. Um, there's always green and red lights that you see. So ensure access. Keep inviting all the children to enlighten you, giving them different means to express themselves. Consequences. Pay attention to how the child's participation affects its position in the child community. Is it something that makes it better for the child or does it actually challenge the child's position? Respect, ensure to have a trustful, appreciative and reciprocal relation with the child. Relations are one of the most important things. Dignity, respect the child's confidentiality by safeguarding its rights, dignity and private room. Keep challenging yourself, challenge yourself to keep learning about your preconceptions. Your Face dilemmas and challenges. 
one thing is to see them but also face them and just be aware that you need someone else to support you in this and one of the places where you can actually get support is that you can engage systematically with, with colleagues at your early childhood center or at your school you can engage in ethical consideration and including children's perspectives in your existing academic network, for instance, in relation to the European school education. So if you talk about math or whatever, you can again talk about what are the ethical considerations in including children's perspective on their learning environment in uh, classes. And you can also attend the free network on ethical consideration, including children's perspective in education the ICIPE network, and that has hosts an upcoming meeting April the 24th. So you just do that by, by writing the mail there. Um, yeah, just remember ethically, there's no, no return. Once you get into this, if children do not recognize our experience of having included the perspective in our exploration and learning, our investigation may leave them disillusioned. And even worse, we might even not notice because we've lost interest. So once we look into this, if we don't actually get it, we stop looking and that might things, make things even worse. So therefore we need to be prepared for engaging in this unpredictable never ending journey that will probably change us forever. We do get wiser from um, listening to children. So now we got to the final thing. Um, which is in the Learn Lab session, the code for that. If you into the home to the web page, you can uh, use this tap in this number four two six nine eight six, and just type in in this uh, word cloud. I could improve my ethical conversation by paying more attention to, and you add that in, and then we'll have a look at the word cloud. I'm waiting for the responses uh, per Zilli now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have one uh, response so far concerning policies. I could improve my ethical consideration by paying more attention to policies. I, I, I actually think um, that needs a little bit of uh, uh, you know, uh, exploration, what, it, what, it, <laughs> what is meant about the policies. Um, does that mean that it's it's a policy of all that you actually have to include children's perspective addressing the uh, UN Convention, but it could also be policies that you have at school or educational level. Um, so it, it could be many different ways of, of how how do we address um, it that we actually have to address. Mm -hmm. uh, we can give give the participants uh, one. Uh, or two minutes more to reply. Um, let me inform you that you can click uh, already on the session code for this session. Uh, it's a link where uh, which you can click and you can join um, this word cloud. And we would be more than happy to see uh, your input in this question. And maybe while uh, participants are working on that, I would like to mention a few comments that came through the chat, if, if that's okay for you, Brazil. Yeah. And then I can, uh, in a few minutes before we close, I can share my screen um, and see some results. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had um, we had some input. Um, Niall mentioned that um, it is impossible to operate a learning space as an educator uh, without creating data. And uh, he he also mentioned that um, he asked uh, basically how children make se can make sense um, and how adults make sense and uh, and bridging them. I, I if I'm understanding correctly, um, maybe he's asking how uh, can we perceive uh, 
uh, children's thoughts maybe and how adults make uh, and how children can perceive adults thoughts and how we can make this uh, bridging how we can bridge those two <laughs> and I think okay. it, it, something that's very important is that um, we have um, the conditions for engaging in dialogues and getting to understand each other can sometimes feel challenging. Um, the only thing is that if we don't, we miss the point. So we really need to address it. And I think one of the answers would be that we need to address children communities uh, and, and make the children engage together with us as well and, and address it like that and make, make them help us. They, they explore with us. Indeed, that's very helpful. I hope you can uh, see my screen. I'm sharing uh, some results that are coming. Uh, so we can see that uh, participants uh, are mentioning children's rights, inclusion, uh, citizenship, culture, family history of students. No, it, it is very nice to hear uh, different opinions. It, it, it is nice to collect some uh, thoughts and um, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts here. I saw there was just one saying that a feeling like a bridge between children and parents. And I think that's a very important issue that uh, when we think about uh, a child's learning environment, it's, it's not only what happens in school, it's also how you connect to your home and your setting. and. Um, the insights you get as being a confident adult might be something that can help in the other setting. As parents, they come to school with, with their ideas. It's also the other way around that the adults at school uh, at early childhood settings can actually enlighten and inform parents about uh, what's at stake for their children. Um, I think I will stop sharing now so that we can uh, conclude. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know, we are not missing any, um, any other, um, okay. There was one more, but we can't make it. <laughs> Just okay, yeah, <laughs> no, we don't have time to be honest, no. but... Uh, no. You I'm can uh, maybe you can take a look on this question, and uh, the participants can take a look on this uh, on this the question. The point with reflect. this was, was Mylena, sorry if I interrupt, and was that sometimes when we try to understand what's what what would it look like when we ask the children, um, except where, for instance about the secrets. Well, it would be like, can I trust you? Uh, will you tell me off if I tell you something that I'm, I'm doing that I know that I should not doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And once you think about how could that sound from a child? We are already helping ourselves to change the perspective. We don't know the question, but it helps us to get more curious about what could be at stake. That's indeed a very interesting topic and um, wish we had more time to discuss it because the way we perceive children's questions and their thoughts and how they will react and if they will, uh, feel confident to trust us, um, their thoughts. It's, it's very important indeed and how we can handle it as adults. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's almost five now. And um, if uh, you don't have uh, further questions uh, or if you have some questions, please, uh, we have one more minute. We can solve one or two and we can reply to one or two. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please uh, feel free. Uh, to take a look on the upcoming learning events on uh, the European School Education Platform. As you can see, we have uh, included the webinar here that took place today. And um, you can explore some of the upcoming courses. You can uh, always click the links there um, on the presentation on your screen right now. Um, and uh, I don't see any questions here in the chat. Let me remind you that there are no certificates a certificate um, issued for this uh, webinar and um, we have shared with you the feedback form which we kindly invite you to fill in. We need, we need your feedback. We really appreciate when you take some time to provide us with your feedback and your thoughts. 
and um, I think we should conclude, Brazil. Mm -hmm. We would like to thank you. It was a very interesting session indeed. And me, myself personally, I learned a few things that I have never thought of them, some considerations that teachers have as well. And uh, I believe that our audience also enjoyed it because we saw some uh, very positive comments. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we hope to see you soon in uh, our upcoming uh, learning events on the European School Education platform. Um, please uh, visit the website uh, uh, as uh, often as possible because we uh, keep posting uh, things, uh, we keep posting events uh, so that you will be updated. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brazil. Um, have a nice uh, evening, everyone.